If you're tired of arguing with strangers on the internet, try talking with one of them in real life. Welcome to Back in America, the podcast. Quick update before we start this episode. As you know, I usually ask my guests to share books or movies they really enjoy. If you want to read those books, just go to the notes section of the episode. You will find a link to Amazon where you can purchase those books. Also, I've been pretty busy recently, recorded four episodes in a week, and I think they are just amazing. I look forward to your comments and suggestion. Tell me what you like, what you want to see more of. Uh, And the easy way to do that is just to send me a direct message from Twitter. My handle is Bertolo. Hello, I'm Stan Bertolo and this is Back in America. Today, I'm at the Princeton Library with Councilwoman Leticia Fraga, the first Latinx ever elected to Princeton Municipal Government. I am so grateful that you accepted this interview, Leticia. Thank you for taking the time to share your story with me today. You have many responsibilities in Princeton. Can you briefly introduce yourself as well as the various commissions that you lead? Sure. And thank you for inviting me to this interview. I am very uh, thrilled to be speaking to you about the work that I'm doing because I think it's important for others. Uh, Others will be able to, who have not... uh, even thought of themselves and being able to be in uh, elected, in an elected position, can hopefully, through uh, learning about my work, uh, will hopefully uh, will uh, encourage them uh, okay. to follow suit. I've been on the on council. Uh, this is uh, starting on my third year. Mm-hmm. Very excited uh, with the committees uh, that I've been assigned to. Uh, from from year one, I would say, uh, and I've built up on those, uh, uh, starting with uh, liaison to the Civil Rights Commission, mm-hmm. uh, the Human Services Commission, uh, Public Safety. I happen to be the uh, designated uh, police commissioner here in Princeton. Mm. I lead the Youth Advisory Committee, Economic Development, the... Uh, Local emergency planning. Right. Now I've uh, this starting this year, taken over being liaison to the board of health, which I feel th- there's a really clear connection between uh, human services, board of health, and I would even say uh, civil rights, as far as ensuring uh, that there's uh, equal access to health care. Yeah. Wow. You are pretty busy. I'm busy, but it's uh, work that I truly, truly enjoy. And you were elected in uh, 2018, right? Yes. Okay. So we are going to come back to that. Let's back up to your early days. Uh, Obviously, you are from Mexico. Yes. I read that you uh, immigrated to the U.S. at the age of 12. Yes. Can you tell us about it? What was your experience? And... I would love you to tell me what was your first impression when you step into the U.S. Sure. I am uh, bo- I'm originally born in Mexico, Mexicali, Baja California, and uh, I am one of eight. I have seven mm-hmm. siblings. And back in 1970, my dad uh, had his own business. Uh, his business was on the U.S. side. We lived close to the border. Economically, things weren't going well. Uh, and also on top of that, my mom's, uh, her health, uh, she had some health issues. Her doctors had actually recommended that she move to try moving to a cooler climate. Um, my mom, uh, the majority of her family, uh, she also comes from a large family, uh, was uh, in Mexicali. And it was very, very difficult for her. Mm-hmm. Uh, to make that decision. Uh, In fact, the only way she agreed uh, to come was if it was just going to be temporary. And my dad had said, let's try for one year. 
so we left everything behind, our house, our household belongings, uh, and we just came. Um, actually, there were um, 12 of us because my uncle and his wife traveled to, to Mexicali to pick us up, and we traveled 12 of us in a station wagon. Uh, pulling a little trailer with some of our belongings because it was only going to be for one year. How did uh, you feel at the time? Was uh, it exciting? Oh, yes. So I can say for my mom, it was a sacrifice for her, leaving family, uh, uh, leaving everything that she knew, uh, leaving her home, mm -hmm. uh, her home where, where uh, most of us uh, kids were born. We were born at home to a place that she was not familiar with, didn't know what to expect. So for her, I mean, there were a lot of tears mm. leaving. For the children, for my siblings and I, uh, it was exciting. It was an adventure. We didn't speak any English. I would say not even uh, no, there were numbers or ABCs, nothing. We didn't even how to say hello. We didn't know anything. Uh, and so... Um, so was it the first time you left the country? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it was exciting. It was exciting for us. Um, so my first uh, impression, it was we hadn't gotten very far. We actually had just crossed the border and had gotten in. Uh, we went to our very first Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> I had not tasted American food before. So everything was an adventure. Did you Every like it? I did. Yeah. I don't anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm more uh, self-conscious and a healthy eater, mm -hmm. I would like to say. So, no, uh, I did at the time. Yeah, you were 12 years old, right? Yes. And so, but on that note, too, uh, arriving, uh, my family settled in uh, Kennewick, Washington. Most of the uh, Mexican families that lived there were uh, migrants. Right. So they followed the crops. Uh, our family was very unique in that. We were only one of a few that actually settled there. Mm. In fact, at the schools at the time, there was no ESL classes. So when we were sent to school, we dove in. We had, uh, the school did provide for all the children mm. a tutor for one hour a day mm. uh, to teach us English. So you crossed into uh, the U.S. Mm. Was it legally? Yes. You, at the yes. time, you managed to have a... Uh, so uh, I've, I consider myself very fortunate. Uh, my dad was actually born in Colorado, so he, he, as being U.S. born. Mm -hmm. And he was also very forward-thinking, so that uh, because he was a U.S. citizen, as each of us were born, we were born in Mexico, but he submitted the paperwork mm. for us to be... We weren't citizens, but we had legal permanent residency. Okay. We could choose to live yeah, where we live wanted to live. Yeah. So very forward thinking. So for us, when the decision was made to come here, it was an option mm -hmm. that, like I said, it was very fortunate to so have that option. What did you do once you got there? You went to school? Yes, we went to school. I was 12. Uh, we were also expected just as... We would have, if we had been in Mexico, is uh, to help uh, contribute to the family. And so uh, we went to work in the fields, hmm. except for the youngest children. How did you feel about that? I, I thought it was great. Yeah? No, we, uh, we started off um, working in the asparagus fields. Mm -hmm. uh, it was that season when we were there. Uh, but then, um, depending on what the season was, we also picked apples, picked cherries. In the winter time, that job I did not like. And to this day, I, I would not do that again. But, but it was a job. Uh, we uh, worked uh, in the vineyards, uh, pruning the vines. Mm. So doing that, you know, a lot of scratches and, and doing that in the cold, that was not my favorite. Did you walk every day? Yes. Yeah, from 3.30 to... We, no, actually, it was earlier. What? We would go before school. Wow. So just as the sun was rising, uh, we would go uh, to work the fields. And then after school, we would go back again. But always our parents ensured that we did our school or mm. schoolwork as well. So we did it s seven days a week. 
And what do you think that taught you? Not only taught me the the value of of earning a living, mm -hmm. uh, responsibility, and taught me to appreciate what we have. Right. Uh, at the time, uh, we were working early on uh, when we were in elementary and junior high. Uh, we were um, our what we earned went towards the family fund. Hmm. But then, uh, once a year, uh, even with eight kids, my family, my parents managed to take us on vacation. Yeah. We went to Disneyland for the first time. Really? Uh, and uh, we even traveled back to Mexico to visit family in, in the yeah, city. Yeah, so you, you kept Fran in Mexico, right? Yes. What yes. would you tell them? Did you write to them? Well, it was, if it had been social media, I would say <laughs> yes. Uh, we did with cousins. Our cousins were like, like our friends. Okay. So we stayed in touch with our cousins. There was a lot of letter writing. Yeah. Uh, Do you remember what you told them? Uh, everything we were doing, our experiences, shared our e experiences with them. I would also say um, that as far as the values that we were taught, uh, it's just something that uh, it concerns me mm -hmm. in, in the younger generations. Uh, that uh, even for my own kids, uh, that uh, sometimes I'm concerned that things come too easy for them right. and that it's not benefiting them. Um, now, going back to what uh, the work that we did, I, even at, at the age of 12, we were expected, in addition to working in the fields, we were expected to, uh, to help. Uh, around the house. Right. Uh, I have uh, a twin sister and a sister that's just one year younger than us and then an older sister. And all the girls were expected to take turns uh, cooking. Uh, we would take, one would cook, mm -hmm. one would do the dishes, and, and then another one would make uh, the tortillas because we were expected to make homemade tortillas every single day. Um, well, yeah, so you learn how to cook, right? Which a lot of cook. young people don't know. Exactly. And then on the weekends, we had to take turns cleaning sections of the house or doing the laundry. Now, what didn't happen was uh, because of whether cultural or that's how they, my parents had been raised, only the girls had those responsibilities. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the boys, their responsibility was to take out the garbage ones. Day, and that's it once a week uh and yes uh and they were there's three brothers five girls three brothers so when i got older when i had my own family uh i i actually made the statement uh, ours is going to be an equal opportunity household okay because i don't see it as uh, mm -hmm. right i i see it as an opportunity because my children i wanted both the girls and the boys to learn how to uh, do things for themselves. Right. We are going to come back to that because, as you say, you know, you are a woman. You are a woman from um, uh, Latino origin. And, um, and I'm sure you have a lot to share about your experience yes. in the political world. Before we do that, let's uh, stick to the uh, early days and you work in the field. I printed from your website this yeah. picture. Oh, okay. Can you describe it to us? That day, I think that was the end of the season. Okay. And uh, we had cleared the fields and uh, gathered all the dry brush. And th this is in eastern Washington where it's uh, very desert-like. Hmm. We get tumbleweeds. That oh, really? We, there's actually recently there was a tumbleweed avalanche where <laughs> cars were buried under tumbleweeds. Uh, we actually would, just for fun, uh, make... Uh, pretend snowmen out of tumbleweeds by stacking them up and dressing them. Uh, but this, after we had cleared the fields and, and picked up all the brush, I remember uh, uh, there was a fire pit where we burned all the brush. And I got too close to it. And for a while there, I was without eyebrows. Whoa. Uh, but, you know, there's instances where uh, I can laugh at now. You know, obviously it was dangerous at the time and some of the things that that uh, some of the situations that uh, we would some, sometimes find ourselves in. Mm. But now, you know, I honestly believe that 
everything that I've experienced. When I talked about working in the fields, you know, even in, in grade school and getting up before sunset, I, I don't refer to it as, woe is me, poor me. I, I thought, you know, I still just like coming here. It was an adventure. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was character building. Yeah, so you came here at the age of 12. Yes. You went to school without speaking a word of English. You learn everything at school. Yes. Uh, you had a tutor one hour a day. Uh, you walked before school in the field. Uh, in your house, you were expected to cook, to clean. The boys, their only job was to take the trash out. Right. right? And you just told me that uh, this is something that you... You want to see changed in your own household yes. where you want everybody. How many kids have you got? I have five. Five boys and girls, right? Uh, I have two boys and three girls. Right. Uh, three, three of them are adult with their own families. Mm-hmm. And then my youngest one, my youngest two are twins. Okay. Uh, 15 year olds that are still at home. So you definitely have um, a view on what it means to be a woman in yes. this country. Yes. And what it means to be a woman from Latinx origin. Yes. So let me say first, as far as uh, Latinx woman serving uh, in elected office, it's not something. It's not something I ever even imagined. It's not something I even dared to aspire to. So it's it's not something that I would say growing up, I, I said to myself, this is what I want to do when I grow up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would even say for, uh, even as an adult, I would often joke, uh, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Right. Uh, and as far as politics, uh, I can honestly say that uh, I did not choose politics. Politics chose me because of the opportunities that I had throughout my life Mm -hmm. that took me different paths. Uh, So everything that I've done, uh, it wasn't until someone that was, uh, some of our, uh, who were in office at the time encouraged me to run for office. And well, I was flattered, but at the same time- What did you think? Me? (laughs) (laughs) That's what you thought. Me? Why me? Can I do it? (laughs) Can I do it? But then when I started thinking about why I should, why I needed to, uh, then I realized that it was it it was something that I needed to do. Why did you need it for yourself? No. Uh, So if I can back up, when I was in Seattle, uh, I worked for civil rights enforcement. It was my dream job. I really, uh, I, I, I really love the work that I was doing. I was, uh, at the time, uh, my now husband, we weren't married at the time, was already work, is working in pharmaceutical for, uh, as Bristol Myers used to have a site in Seattle. Mm-hmm. And he had been transferred there, and that's how we met. I was working in Seattle. BMS closed that site, and he was given the opportunity to transfer to New Jersey. He's originally from New Jersey, for her, so for him it was a no-brainer. For me, however, we weren't married yet, but still we were, we were together. Uh, but for me, was able to empathize with what my mom went to, hmm. went through, a job that I loved, my family, my uh, my siblings, my my adult children. I have grandkids. I have nine grandkids, by the way. Wow. Uh, they were all there. To leave that behind was really difficult decision for me. In fact, when I did, when he did convince me to give New Jersey a try, I actually only uh, took a leave of absence from my work. Mm. Like I was your mom, sure. right? <laughs> like my mom. I took a one-year leave of absence, and I thought, I'm, I'm going to give it a try. But to be quite honest, uh, when I came to Princeton, in the beginning, I didn't have a warm and fuzzy feeling about being here. My impression was that the people were very cliquish. Uh, and, and you didn't feel welcome? I did not feel welcome. 
In was fact, it, was it because you weren't from there? Was it because you were of Latin origin? Was I I don't know. It's just a, a sense, and and just to be clear, um, something that I'm very sensitive about is being too sensitive. Mm, okay. So I'm often second guessing myself, like. Am I being treated this way? Am I being talked to this way because, because of uh, I'm Mexican, because I'm a woman, or am I being too sensitive? So, but so you could still make the difference between how you were treated in Seattle. Oh yes, and oh, no. how it was here. Seattle, I already knew, was very progressive. Uh, it was very easy to make friends. It's a big city, but I could still, even when I would go back to visit, walk down the street and run into people I knew mm -hmm. and who would greet me. Uh, here, um, it, was, it, it was just culture shock for me. Uh, I would say even in the neighborhood where I first moved to, it's, uh, it's one of those uh, uh, private communities that are you know, the homeowners association, the whole works. Uh, and I remember uh, walking to the mailbox and, and that's where you tend to meet the neighbors. Uh, and someone coming, you know, very often growing up, but I would get asked, so what are you? Mm. You know, I know they're asking me what's my background, but it doesn't yeah, it seem yeah, offensive it's, to say, what are you? What are you? I'm a human being. <laughs> uh, exactly. Uh, so uh, I remember uh, a neighbor at the post office asking me that. Where are you? Uh, I said, well, um, my background, I'm originally from Mexico. And then their comeback was, oh, my son has a housekeeper that's from Mexico. So yeah. it, that's Frankly how, offensive. how yeah. so they related they, they were trying to make small talk, I know, <laughs> but how they related to me. I now live, I actually now live across from the high school, so I walked okay, here. Yeah. Uh, and, but I remember uh, we moved there five years ago, uh, and by that time I had a dog. By the way, uh, I found that uh, before we had, uh, my husband and I had our twins, uh, we, uh, we had a dog, and I remember getting to know, meet people in the neighborhood. Through the dogs. Through the dog. They knew, they didn't know my name. They didn't remember my name, but they knew they my knew. dog's name. Uh, so how did you make it through? You know, yes. how did you manage to make Princeton your city? So, and that's where I would encourage others to do. Because I, I tell that story, including even, you know, after I moved uh, to where I am now, I remember my first, I had already been here. I felt myself. You know, like I'm established now. I wasn't on council yet, but uh, I've made myself known through my work. Mm -hmm. uh, but even there, I remember walking my dog in the new neighborhood, and and someone asking me, oh, "I haven't, s hello, I haven't seen you here before." Uh, uh, and uh, are you a dog walker? Right. Gosh. No. No. Are you new to the neighborhood? They assume, looking at me. Mm -hmm. I couldn't possibly live in this neighborhood. I must be a dog walker. Uh, anyway, I made Princeton my home mm -hmm. when I decided this is my home. was when I made the effort. So it came from you. It came from me. So uh, I can actually pinpoint the day uh, reading the, I believe it was, it was either the packet or the town topics, one of our local papers, reading a story about this office, the human services department, who, because of uh, budget cuts, was now down to a one-woman office, mm -hmm. Cynthia Mendez. Uh, and even though her last name is Mendez, uh, she did not speak Spanish. And in the story, it, uh, pointed out that this office uh, actually served uh, a significant number of our Latino population, but now because of funding, they had lost the only individual that spoke Spanish. Right. So I gave her a call and volunteered my services. And it, it started from there. How were you welcomed? There I was. Yeah? Most definitely because of my background. So uh, You were helpful. <laughs> I was very helpful. I actually... 
was able to suggest procedures mm -hmm. that we could implement to improve this, our service to the community. So I had only been there for a few months when uh, a position opened up on the Human Services Commission, and I was invited to uh, join. Wow. So this is very interesting. And being French, I can really relate to that, you know, how disheartening this is to be in a community where you don't really feel welcome. You are one. I mean, nobody told me if I asked me if I was a dog walker, but nobody really, you know, pay attention to me. Right. And coming from, you know, a different culture, you sort of expect your neighbor to invite you, people to come to you saying, oh, you know, would you like to come for a drink or something? Yeah. And that doesn't happen. And right. you feel very secluded. Right. So what you are saying is that your advice would be if you want something to happen, it has to come from you. Right. Well, you know, sometimes it does happen. I, I actually, um, after I've been in my uh, new neighborhood for a while, I did get to meet one of my neighbors uh, who has a son that's the same age as, as mine. So it was just natural for them to become friends. And so she organized something okay. to introduce that's us nice. to the community. Yeah. Yes. So, but I would say, yes, don't wait for somebody to welcome you. Mm -hmm. Don't wait uh, for somebody to invite you to become involved. Right. Uh, to be, to take the initiative to find out what's out there and introduce yourself. How long had you been in Princeton? It'd been a while already. Yeah. Because to tell you the truth, uh, up until, I would say maybe three years. Wow. Well, uh, yeah. Because up until that point, mm. um, my husband can attest to it that I continuously nagged him. I'll use the word nag, even though it's not a very flattering word. I uh, nagged him about uh, looking for opportunities in the West Coast. Mm. Uh, initially, that was the plan. That's why it was only a year. Because at the time, uh, Paul Allen, uh, former Microsoft, mm -hmm. uh, that he was uh, trying to develop Se a part of Seattle to attract biotech to that area. But it just didn't didn't happen. So there were no opportunities, at right. least in Seattle. But So three years then this article, you get involved with the, with the city, with the town, um, and then you apply for a position, an official position there, right? Yes, as a civil rights commissioner. Uh, from there, I actually was invited to join uh, LALDEF, which is the Latin American Legal Defense and Education Fund, right. which was also my colleague. Really? Uh, I didn't know it existed until I was invited. Um, but I also served on the board of the YW, uh, on the board of Princeton Community Housing for Affordable Housing. Uh, and just uh, a lot of my volunteer work that shaped me and prepared me for work uh, to serve as an elected official. Hmm. So now, yeah. as an elected official, um, what are some of your achievements that you're the most proud of? Well, uh, there's, uh, there's several, uh, but for me, let me just say, uh, and this is something that, um, that I need to work on. Everything that I do, everything that I accomplish, generally I don't take credit for it because I don't feel that it's, I feel that it's not just me. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever uh, I've, we've been able to accomplish. Do you think this is very feminine, where a man might, maybe take the credit for it a woman has a harder time taking credit well, for that i can tell you uh as frustrating as it is you know i'm not going to change who i am but as frustrating as it is uh there are um both men and women who have frustrated me by taking credit for things that <laughs> i initiated or that we did as a group mm -hmm. so yes okay so uh, it, let me rephrase the question you know as a group, <laughs> yes. what are you proud of what you have been able to achieve? Proudest accomplishment, uh, starting back with uh, my work on the Human Services Commission. Um, when I found out after joining the commission, I learned that uh, although at one time, uh, at one point in time, there have been a civil rights commission, mm -hmm. a local civil rights commission, it was not act it hadn't been active for years and so 
I advocated for reinstatement of that. It took three years, but we did it. So, uh, and what does that do? The Civil Rights Commission uh, is uh, here to advocate for policies, uh, to make recommendations to mayor and council uh, on, on policies that advance uh, equal protections and equal rights, and including, most recently, was enacted uh, the gender neutral bathrooms for all our right. uh, within Princeton. Uh, last year, the Civil Rights Commission also advocated for and, and council and mayor passed a resolution to establish Indigenous Peoples Day. Mm -hmm. I read that yes, uh, in October. Yes. Uh, the, so the commission, although uh, they don't have the power to enforce mm -hmm. uh, civil rights, uh, it is there to provide uh, guidance and assistance. And when there are uh, uh, issues, uh, when someone's an experience in an issue, whether through work, mm -hmm. uh, through housing, or place of public accommodation, they can come to the commission and the commissioner, there's a uh, subcommittee that's uh, available to help facilitate with conflict resolution. Okay. What are some of the key projects you're working on at the moment? Well, one that that I would like to continue working on, one is a domestic, uh, domestic Workers' Bill of Rights. Uh, we do have a wage theft protection that mainly covers day laborers, but also our uh, uh, workers here mm -hmm. in Princeton. Um, but there's nothing in writing to protect domestic workers. So we'll be working on that. Uh, one of the major ones that is really important and, and I'm very focused on is uh, the upcoming census. Yes. Uh, because uh, in educating and doing outreach uh, to, uh, to ensure maximum participation because not everybody uh, realizes that what our numbers are locally will determine uh, representation uh, in the legislature, but also the funding that is available to us, including for school lunches and, and for uh, grants and, and projects. But that seems, so not knowing how it works, it sort of seems a no-brainer, right? You fill up a form, you declare how many people live in your household, yes, and you've got a clear picture of how many inhabitants Right. you've got in the town correct however and this has been historically this happened in the 2010 census is that historically there's there are populations that are undercounted and that would be i would say number one our immigrant community but also up there are our families individuals of color are also undercounted and the other major group that's undercounted is uh, children five and under and why is that? I would say for as far as for, uh, for immigrants and people of color, uh, communities of color, I would say uh, lack of trust. Into, Not trusting in, in, in the government. In the government. They what, might be how is this and they're afraid to be kicked Well, out. definitely for the immigrant community, but for others, even those that have legal status, mm -hmm. just lack of trust is how is this information going, going to be used? especially under this administration, not to get political, but I would say especially under this administration, who already tried to uh, suppress, I would say, participation mm -hmm. by uh, trying to introduce a citizenship question, mm. which is not going to happen, but I, I feel the damage was already done, that, uh, that there's those that will will be afraid to participate. So what do you do to change that? So something that I would like to uh, build on already, another one, you know, as, as we talk, I think of other accomplishments that I'm proud of. So starting with uh, what my work on uh, human services, uh, I s initiated some um, community events uh, to, uh, I, I would refer to them as community building events. Uh, to help uh, build trust mm -hmm. with our communities. Uh, we do a Loteria event, which mm -hmm. is uh, Mexican bingo. It's a very popular event. 
uh, that we started out by uh, holding it at the Y. The YW hosted it for us. But twice already, uh, the university's art museum hosted it for us. Mm. To let folks know that this uh, museum is for you too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, uh, it's open to it's everybody. It's a fantastic museum. Right? It's a fantastic museum. We encourage everybody so to go see it, right? I will share you with you the picture, just how, uh, oh my goodness, it was, to me, it, it, it made my heart swell to see the picture of, uh, we had, uh, at the very least, we had 50 participants, so, but mm -hmm. we've had more, up to 100 of uh at the museum in the main second floor hall, surrounded by these piece of art. magnificent pieces of art. Uh, so we have all these families and participants playing Loteria. So uh, as far as uh, how I have made it into a community building and also building trust, uh, I started out by uh, our s having celebrity callers, the ones that call the cards. Right. So, so what we start celebrities. So Local celebrity, celebrities? well, I and I call them celebrities, but uh, the very first one was our mayor. Okay. Uh, I've had council members also participate. Uh, one of them was our police. Mm -hmm. So we had police uh, in uniform, and I would I would always I always make it a point to introduce them. Mm -hmm. These are our members of our police department. They're here to serve you get to know them uh, and, and, and what kind of feedback did you get from the community? wonderful yeah? wonderful so that's uh, your big project at that's a big project yeah I would say that's my the major one that I'm focused on but there's there's others one that um, I'm hoping for years I've been advocating for one thing that I've learned is that uh, yes we we all share the same values uh, but we may not always have the same priorities. Mm -hmm. So as an individual, it's, it's not easy to get things done unless you have others join in, in working and moving forward. So one of uh, that I ident identified years ago, I mean, and, and it should be obvious to everyone that lives in Princeton, that uh, here in Princeton, we only have one laundromat. Mm -hmm. It's on the other side of town at the shopping center. However, most of our community that is in need of that service lives on the other side of town, in the mm -hmm. Witherspoon Jackson. Right. Uh, the majority of them don't drive. Right. Uh, so, especially where I live now, that's a shortcut. So I, I see them year-round, even in the wintertime, summertime. Um, the men, young men, uh, on their bikes carrying big duffel bags with their laundry. Mm. Uh, we see, uh, I see women with uh, their, um, their strollers loaded up with laundry bags and walking with the children behind them to go to the laundromat on the other side of town. Liliana is one of them that has uh, shared with me how in the for a while there she would hear from uh, teachers commenting to her, would you please talk to this family because their children are, you know, they're coming in, they're close smell mm. or they're dirty. Can you talk to them about the importance of hygiene? Well, they don't take into consideration and realize that uh, when the families don't have access uh, to a laundromat, uh, they most likely are not going to do their laundry as often. On top of that, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, so, again, not as often. So it's so it's an issue that, you know, to me it's so evident that we need to address. And are you addressing it? Well, I'm working on it. I guess the issue as why no one has stepped up yet is because it can be very costly too. Uh, the hookup fees, the sewer hookup fees. Mm. Oh. Okay. Yes, uh, I heard as high as. $10,000 per machine to hook up to the sewer. Uh, I'm looking for opportunities. Could even be a, a public-private partnership, mm -hmm. including, you know, I, I won't get ahead of myself, but I, I see that there are up opportunities coming up now that the municipality is, is set to build more affordable housing. Mm -hmm. If there's something that's within the area, can we look at, at those sites 
and see if there's something that's more accessible. I believe we are getting at the end of this interview. I would uh, still like to ask you a few questions. Sure, please. And um, the first one might be, what keeps you awake at night? The current state of affairs. In this What's country? in this country. I felt that times where this is surreal, uh, I'm going to wake up from a dream because this doesn't seem that this is uh, happening in our country. I think many of us were not expecting it. You mean Trump being yes. elected? Mm -hmm. Many of us, uh, honestly, myself included, didn't see the writing on the wall, didn't think it was going to be possible. In fact, you know, I, I, I was ready to celebrate uh, first woman mm -hmm. president. So that evening, um, when the numbers started coming in, there was just this sense of dread. This is the first time where I literally felt sick. Right. I felt sick. I could not sleep all night. That night, and, and if I felt sick, imagine our uh, immigrant community. Mm. I had uh, individuals, because I'm, I'm very accessible to anyone that wants to reach out, and they have my, my cell number. So I had individuals reaching out to me that night, texting me, do you know any uh, churches that are open? Because I feel I need to go pray. Wow. When I, uh, I, I hear something new, something that is really attacking our way of life, mm -hmm. uh, attacking our, uh, you know, the values that we all know, the value in, in the things that we come to expect from our country. That mm -hmm. keeps me up. So that brings me to a question that I like to ask in this podcast, which is, what does it mean to be an American? To be an American, uh, for me, I, I can say as one that was not originally born, naturalized citizen, it was the proudest moment in my life. What it means is to have uh, opportunities that I may not have had in my country of birth. And I say opportunities because... Uh, I don't take anything for granted, nor uh, should, should others, uh, in whether my family or others, we should not take anything for granted, I think. And, and we're not handed. Even those that, that because of uh, the situation they find themselves in is in need of public assistance, uh, we work for it. Right. No, we... Uh, I pay taxes, mm -hmm. and I do not, uh, I, I feel that if others, if, if what I contribute is helping others, I feel good about that. Uh, and, uh, and also, um, as far as what being an American is, for me, is, um, is just doing my part to really live up to the values that are this country was found how what it was founded on uh maybe it's not necessarily being an american but for me as a mm -hmm. mexican american those opportunities that have been given to me to also pass it forward to not be what I would call some of our, uh, even some of my fellow immigrants, ladder pullers. Mm -hmm. That just because we reached the point where we want to be, uh, even as immigrants, we don't pull the ladder so nobody else can reach it. Mm. We, we need to be able to, to make it possible and do everything within our power to ensure that others have the same opportunities. Okay. Thank you so much. Would you recommend, are there any books or any movie that have forged who you are today that you would recommend listener to uh, read or watch? Well, I, I love to read. So there's been several books that have been, for me, 
have been very meaningful uh, and have made an impact. Uh, one, uh, and I would recommend, is in, in mainly with current affairs as far as with the need for immigration reform. One is Enrique's journey. That was by Sonia or Nazario. Uh, and then the other one I recently read actually hasn't even uh, been published yet. I, I believe it's going to be released later this month. But one of my friends at the library lent me her advanced copy, and it is a must read. It's uh, called American Dirt by Janine uh, Cummins. Okay. And they both deal with, uh, I, I think, for those that are willing to listen, would and would be enlightening for those who question why why are people coming here why don't they just do it the legal way mm -hmm. uh why i think it, it it's very insightful okay as far as that but another one if i can add another one the title is uh, hitler's willing executioners hmm. and it's a dry read but what I got from it is that, and something that, that I keep reminding my own children and grandchildren, is to not be a bystander. Mm -hmm. Just because we're not the ones that are, um, whether it's um, children bullying, whatever the situation may be, to not be bystanders. To take a stand. To take a stand. As an example, my children. They may not be the one that is uh, that are the ones that are excluding someone, but if you're not including them, it's the th same. It's the same. Right. Huh. That's very deep. So three books: Enrique's Journey, American Dirt, and Hitler. Uh, Hitler's Willing Executioners. Willy. Okay. Okay. Well, Leticia, thank you so much. Thank you so very much for this opportunity to. Uh, uh, to talk about my background. Share your story. Yeah. And Thank share you. my story. Thank you. Good. It, we could go on and on, couldn't we?